Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jack Knott, and I am the Dean of the USC School of Policy Planning and Development. It is an extraordinary honor for me to welcome each and every one of you here for the Ronald Reagan Centennial Academic Symposium. As you know, if Ronald Reagan were still living, uh, he would turn 100 years old on February 6th. And to commemorate this occasion and to honor his legacy, there are many celebratory events taking place around the world, including Washington DC, uh, Berlin, and London. But what sets this symposium apart from all these other centennial events is the scholarly examination that we will bring to bear on President Reagan's legacy. My school, the USC School of Policy, Planning, and Develop Development began a process in 2009 with the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation that led not only to this academic symposium, but also to a series of other symposia across the country that will take place in the next several months. Each one will examine a different aspect of President Reagan's presidency. Today and tomorrow, we here at USC will be examining his leadership style, his capacity as the great communicator, and his strategies for negotiating and dealing with legislation before the Congress. These symposia offer our students uh, an unprecedented opportunity to learn about President Reagan's legacy. Uh, and for those of us here in California about his role as governor of California. Uh, most students uh, were not uh, born uh, yet uh, when Ronald Reagan was president and see him as a historical figure, much like, uh, you know, I might look at Teddy Roosevelt or Dwight Eisenhower. And so let me extend a special warm welcome to all the students here in the audience. Before we begin our panel, I want to take a moment to thank uh, School of Policy, Planning, and Development Professor Dan Masmanian, Aubrey Hicks, and the staff from the USC Bedrosian Center on Governance and the Public Enterprise for their exceptional work in organizing uh, today's events. I also want to recognize our colleagues, the faculty from the USC Annenberg School of Communication and Journalism and the USC Center on uh, Communication Leadership and Policy for their enthusiastic collaboration with us and their many contributions to this uh, symposium. And last, but certainly not least, I extend my heartiest thanks to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation, the Centennial Celebration Committee and its executive director, Stuart McLaurin, for their tremendous support and wonderful partnership in putting this uh, event together. Indeed, we are honored to partner with the foundation and be part of President Reagan's centennial celebration. I was at this time going to introduce uh, Dick DeBacus, uh, who uh, was going to introduce our panel, but uh, Dick uh, has contracted a cold as a hoarse voice. Uh, he's here, but uh, didn't want to break out in a coughing spell in the middle of his speech. So I just wanted to say a couple words about Dick, however. He's an alumnus of our school and a tremendous supporter of SBPD. He's also a Trojan parent of Carly DeBacus, who's uh, a student in SBPD. And uh, he's a mentor to many of our students uh, and a respected leader uh, at USC as a member of the USC Board of Trustees, as a member of uh, our school's Board of Counselors, and as the former president of the USC uh, Alumni Association. Uh, he's also, I want to emphasize, uh, the individual responsible for initiating the partnership between our school and the Reagan Foundation. So uh, I'm pleased that you're here, Dick, and sorry that uh, you're uh, not feeling well and hope you'll feel better soon. It is now my, yes, let's give Dick a hand. It is now my pleasure to introduce the moderator of our first panel of this symposium, uh, Professor Richard Callahan. Uh, Professor Callahan serves as an associate dean uh, in the USC School of Policy, Planning, and Development, where he directs the school's state capital uh, center and leadership programs. He cur his current research includes networks and state agencies, leadership training practices, 
and the political design of public agencies. He teaches in the graduate programs in health administration, planning, public administration, and public policy. He serves on the editorial board of the Public Administration Review, board of directors of the Sacramento Healthcare Decisions, the American Congress of Healthcare Executives, and the Executive Council of the Sacramento Chapter of the American Society of Public Administration. For 12 years, he served in local and county government, five of those as manager of a township. So please join me in welcoming Rich Callahan. Thank you, Dean Nod, um, for the kind introduction. Thank you for the opportunity to be here as moderator. Uh, I really want to echo Dean Nott's uh, thanks to uh, Dan Mesmania, as director of the Bedrosian Institute, as really for his leadership in pulling this together and uh, helping us take a lot of ground in putting this together. So I thank Dan for all of his work that made this possible. Thank you very much, Dan. I'd uh, also like to thank my faculty colleagues, Bob Myrtle and uh, Dr. Chet Newland, uh, for their work as we work to pull this panel together and move forward with all of this, and John Bedrosian and his wife Judy for their support of the Bedrosian Center, which invites this examination of leadership and governance. So this is a great opportunity, and uh, to put it immodestly, really a great panel here that we have today. So I thought I'd do a few introductory remarks of each of them. We could actually spend the entire panel discussing any one of their careers. So if you want greater detail, I would encourage you to go to this magnificent thing called the internet. Pull down their website and read in great detail. Um, I'll do a brief introduction and then ask each of the, pa uh, we'll have the, present uh, the presentation of the paper for 20 minutes and each of the panelists will respond for approximately 10 minutes and um, then we will um, have a final response and open up to questions. So my university training prepares me for this role as moderator. It is not my university training at USC or Georgetown, but my university training at Tenry University in Japan, where I trained with their judo team. So I intend to keep people on time here, and I put that out there. Um, let me begin with the introduction of, the, of uh, Jim Piffner. Jim has put together a magnificent paper for our discussion today. He joins us from George Mason University, where he's a chairholder and also a member of the National Academy of Public Administration. He's written over 10 books on the presidency and is really one of the nation's leading scholars in the examination of the presidency. His books have ranged in topics on leadership ranging from strategy to character. Um, he has uh, started his public service uh, as an infantryman in Vietnam and Cambodia for the 25th Infantry Division. And perhaps the strongest compliment that can be paid to him is in one of the book reviews the reviewer said about a recent book that uh, he continues his customary thoughtfulness and scholarly integrity. And I can't think of a higher compliment that could be paid. So following Jim, we will have uh, the, the following speakers and we'll have Mike Genovese will join us. And he joins us as a faculty member of the Loyola Chair at Loyola Marymount University. He has his PhD from University of Southern California, but he is here on the merits of his presidential scholarship um, and uh, is really seen as one of the leaders nationally, the former president of the Presidential Studies um, uh, Research Group for the American Political Science Association. And so we're very honored to have him here and bring his presidential scholarship and he'll follow Jim. Following that, we'll have Peter Hannaford, who brings four decades of experience in the public sector and a great understanding of, of, of leadership as an advisor to presidents, to leaders of other nations, to companies. He has uh, been described favorably as the ultimate Washington insider, someone who can navigate and negotiate and understand Washington. He brings to us a, a very valuable perspective having worked with Ronald Reagan as governor of California and in that period of time between the governorship and the presidency. And so we're deeply honored that he can bring his communication and his skills as a great communicator to talk to us today. And then finally, our final uh, panelist is Ralph Bledsoe. Uh, Ralph has strong University of Southern California connections, uh, having his earned his doctorate degree here from the then School of Public Administration, and serving both as the founding director in 1971 of the Sacramento Center 
for the uh, school and then serving subsequently as the Washington Public Affairs Center Director. He's been former faculty at the Federal Executive Institute. Uh, he's a member of the National Academy of Public Administration. He was special assistant to President Reagan and of particular relevance to our retrospective and our scholarly inquiry, he was the founding director of the uh, Ronald Reagan Presidential Library. So we're very fortunate to have a range of uh, scholarship and personal experience with Ronald Reagan as governor, as president, and in that time in between. So I think we have a panel that is enormously well suited to kick off this important uh, 100th year uh, anniversary. And uh, I've really been, in working with them, you can see uh, the qualities that they bring and the thoughtfulness that each of the panelists bring. So uh, very glad to have that. And so without any further um, interruption, I'd like to introduce our featured speaker, uh, Jim Piffner, and welcome him and look forward to his comments. Rich, thank you very much for that uh, overly kind introduction. This looks like a fascinating conference, and I'd like to thank the organizers here at USC and at the Reagan Library for putting together this really wonderful uh, symposium. In my remarks, I'd like to focus on Ronald Reagan as president. Ronald Reagan was larger than life. He was a formidable politician and an important president. Both his successes and his failures were rooted in his character uh, and style of leadership. President Reagan's great strength as a leader came from his optimism and his conviction that America was good and that most political problems were basically simple. His, this gave him the great strength to lead and it inspired his, his followers. But as my old friend Elliot Richardson often said, we all have the defects of our virtue. So Reagan, Reagan's certainty about simple problems and simple solutions led to his political triumphs but as well as to his failures and to his paradoxical legacy. Ronald Reagan is remembered as a tax cutter, but he signed some of the largest tax increases in U.S. history. He's remembered as standing firm against terrorism, yet he withdrew mis uh, Marines from Lebanon and he traded arms for hostages. He fought for huge increases in defense spending, yet he almost bargained away the U.S. nuclear stockpile at Reykjavik. He believed in law and order, yet he allowed his White House staff to break the law. He, he was a staunch foe of communism, but he led the United States to a new understanding of Russia. So I'll examine uh, some of these paradoxes in th three, three separate issues. One, his transition into office. A second, his White House staff. Uh, and third, in national security, some of the high points and, and the low points. Presidential transitions in the United States usually in the past had not been taken very seriously, but the Reagan administration really took them to a, a new level uh, of organization. <clears throat> they, took, uh, they decided that they wanted to hit the ground running, uh, and they came in with hundreds of people in transition headquarters in Washington, D.C. Uh, there were people running things. There was a huge superstructure of advisors. There were uh, transition teams. There were task forces. Uh, and in each uh, agency, the federal government transition teams uh, came to help uh, the transition to the Reagan presidency. I remember I was at Cal State Fullerton and went to the Office of Personnel Management as a, uh, a one-year exchange. And, and at, at, the, at OPM, the next day after the election, Don Devine was there, who was going to be the new head of Office of Personnel Management. Uh, and he had an office and so forth, and we were briefing him on uh, how OPM operated and so forth. And this took place uh, throughout the whole federal government. But perhaps the most important aspect of presidential transition planning was undertaken by, President, uh, by Pendleton James, uh, and it was about recruiting presidential personnel. Now, this is always a very difficult uh, thing to do because in the United States, there's about, believe it or not, 8,000 presidential appointments that can, that can be made. This is more than any other um, uh, democracy uh, in the world. And so it's, it's a great challenge, I mean, logistical as well as everything else. Now, the Reagan people were really concerned uh, because they thought that both Presidents Nixon uh, and Carter made cru crucial mistakes in their approaches to cabinet government. Each of them delegated to their cabinet secretaries the right to put together their own management teams. 
uh, choose their people, and the president would, uh, would appoint them. The problem with this from the perspective of the White House was that they, these people became, uh, were seen as loyal to the cabinet secretary instead of loyal, loyalty to, loyal to the president. So James and the other White House staffers insisted on White House, political, White House control of all political appointees. Now, of course, at the very top level, presidential appointments with consent of the Senate, those are clearly presidential. But the next levels, non-career senior executive service and Schedule C, level people lower in the bureaucracy are technically agency head appointments, but Ronald Reagan insisted that they be cleared uh, through the, the White House personnel office, and if the president wants to do that, that's the way uh, it, it ends up. So to enforce central control and ideological purity, uh, they constructed a very elaborate uh, uh, clearance uh, gauntlet that it, uh, in order that for nominees to survive, they had to go through six or seven different levels of Reagan officials checking off, you know, is there any skeletons in the closet, uh, and so forth. You know, so the advantage of this Reagan revolution in personnel selection was the assurance of loyalty to President Reagan. The downside, however, was a narrow definition of ideological purity, which left out some good Republicans that had served in previous administrations because they weren't Reagan Republicans. It also took an awful long time to, uh, to, to run through this process. Uh, six months, 12 months into the uh, first year of the administration, there are still a, a lot of uh, sub-cabinet appointees who are not yet uh, on board. Another uh, impressive aspect of the Reagan transition was the accomplishment of his initial policy agenda. In contrast to Jimmy Carter, who uh, used what I call the shotgun approach, he had many different uh, uh, initiatives that he wanted to get passed, and he, in a sense, threw them all at Congress, hoping that some of them would pass. But Reagan, I think, very wisely uh, chose what I call the rifle uh, uh, approach, which is a narrow focus on just his, uh, his main priorities, which were tax cuts, uh, domestic spending cuts, and military uh, uh, increases. And, and this kind of focus allowed him really to uh, make, uh, to achieve the kinds of uh, uh, victories that were not possible before and his very successful first uh, six months uh, in office. Uh, in addition, Reagan was convinced that by, by the supply side approach to uh, economics that cutting taxes would turn around the economy and lead to a balanced budget, and of course the economy was in terrible shape uh, at, that, at that time. So Reagan did lead uh, th through uh, uh, these initial uh, economic agendas. He got them through Congress, uh, but the tax cuts did not bring about the kind of economic growth that they had hoped for. Uh, the supply siders expected. Uh, the result was a deficit of more than $100 billion and climbing each year, David Stockman said, as far as uh, the eye can see. Uh, so Reagan's advisors recognized that in the second year uh, and convinced him uh, to pass the uh, uh, the Tax Equity Fiscal Responsibility Act of 1982, which was the largest tax hike in U.S. history, in, in peacetime anyway. So in, in addition, okay, so, so the economy was starting to come back and Paul Volcker loosened up a monetary policy and the combination of that with the economic stimulus from increased uh, defense spending and tax cut, le cuts led the economy to one of the largest, uh, the second largest expansion since, uh, since World War II. So the economic consequences of uh, President Reagan's economic policies were mixed. Uh, the economy grew, the, the stock market uh, profit, uh, but the national debt tripled from $1 trillion in 1981 to $3 trillion in 1989. The national savings rate declined from 7.7 percent in the 1970s to 2.8 percent uh, in, in the 1980s. Uh, and the United States became uh, changed from the largest creditor nation to the largest uh, debtor nation. So in summary, uh, Reagan's most impressive achievements were his transition into uh, policy achievements, it transition into office, uh, his revolution in personnel appointments, and his policy victories uh, on the economic uh, side. And these, budget, or these uh, legislative victories uh, were, can be attributed to, one, he dropped the anti-Washington rhetoric once he got to Washington. He was assiduous in courting Congress uh, and, and dealing individually with members of Congress. Uh, he moved very quickly to take advantage of his mandate, uh, and he focused his agenda very tightly on his economic uh, priorities. Shifting to White House organization uh, and management, President Reagan was really a big picture leader who didn't enjoy and sometimes didn't understand the details of his policy. His, his great strength was setting strategic priorities uh, and uh, direction and then delegating to his subordinate, uh, subordinates. Uh, and his genius allied in his, lay in his ability to pick the right people to do this. Uh, his management philosophy, he summed it up as quoting him, surround yourself with the best people you can, 
can find delegate authority and don't interfere as long as the policy you've decided on is being carried out. The only flaw in this, in this formulation was that President Reagan was al not always skillful in finding out whether his policies were being carried out or not. So he really depended on his White House staff and having the right people there when if the wrong people were in charge, disaster uh, uh, was certainly possible. So, so the strength and the vulnerabilities of Reagan's management philosophy were illustrated by the difference between his first term and his second term. In his first term, President Reagan, uh, interestingly, he was very passive with respect to the White House staff uh, and management. Uh, so, he, uh, and his first uh, the key choice of the uh, chief of staff was to have J to appoint James A. Baker. Now, Baker was not an obvious choice because he had run uh, George Bush's campaign for the, for the nomination in 1980 uh, and not at all expected to be the chief of staff. Uh, but Michael Lever and Stuart Spencer convinced Pr Ronald Reagan to do it and presented him with the uh, recommendation and he said, well, fellas, if you think so, I'll go along with it. Now this was, uh, I think, an inspired uh, choice and Reagan deserves a credit for making this brilliant but non-obvious appointment. <clears throat> now the conservative Reagan backers saw that, uh, thought Baker was a pragmatic moderate uh, and a real disaster, but Reagan's insight was that he would need a sophisticated Washington insider in order to achieve the very conservative political and policy goals that he had. The other two key people in the White House were Edwin Meese, uh, who held cabinet rank and had the title of counselor to the president for policy, and Michael Deaver, who was a brilliant uh, public relations genius who concerned himself with the public presentation of the president uh, and his personal schedule, and also was a confidant to Nancy Reagan, which was one of the keys uh, in the Reagan White House. So this staffing structure really served Reagan well during his first term, uh, and they engineered the great success of his initial uh, policy agenda, but it also led to infighting, you know, three different people with different perspectives. Uh, there was a lot of uh, backstabbing and so forth, but nevertheless, it got to Ronald Reagan the kind of uh, uh, information he needed when his uh, uh, advisors disagreed about things. The other, one other th the interesting thing about Reagan was that he was very unwilling to provide his concrete leadership to his uh, 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 team. Interesting, just a couple of quotes here. Don Regan, Secretary of the Treasury, said, after I accepted the job, he simply hung up and vanished, didn't give any direction. Martin Anderson said, he made no demands and gave no, almost no instructions. David Stockman said, he gave no orders, no commands, asked for no information. Whenever there was an argument, Reagan would smile and say, okay, you fellows work it out. So a very interesting detached style of, of leadership that worked well uh, and led to success in his, his first, uh, first term. The second term, however, was a different story. In November of 1984, after the election, uh, Donald Reagan and James Baker decided that they wanted to switch jobs. Uh, Baker was burned out uh, hassling with the White House. Um, uh, Reagan wanted to be in charge of everything, uh, and so they got together and made that agreement, and, and after two more months, they let the president know and suggested it to him. They presented the plan, and he didn't, interestingly, he didn't ask about their reasons for doing it or anything else. He said, uh, and in, in his memoirs, he said, when I heard about it, it sounded all right to me. Uh, so this incident, I think, among others, underscores the, the paradox that despite his active agenda, President Reagan was very passive about his White House personnel, uh, and he did not seem to understand how important his, his key White House people uh, were. So in the second term, he didn't seem to notice the change that came over the White House when some of the first term people began to leave. Uh, Baker left for Treasury, of course, uh, took uh, Richard Darman and Margaret Tutwiler with him. Uh, Edwin Meese uh, went to be Attorney General. Michael, Michael Deaver left. David Stockman left. Max Friedersdorf, a brilliant uh, um, uh, uh, person dealing with Congress, left. Ed Rollins left. And so this left Don Regan alone as being in charge of, of the Reagan presidency. Uh, and under the mantra of let Reagan be Reagan, uh, Reagan was able to dominate the White House staff and insisting that he control uh, everything. Uh, Ronald Reagan in his memoirs said, and this is you know, backed up by lots of other uh, evidence, he resisted having others see me alone and wouldn't forward letters or documents to me unless he saw them first. In short, he wanted to be the only conduit uh, to, the pub, uh, to, to the Oval Office. So what Reagan did, he shielded Reagan from staff conflict, but it also narrowed the range of advice and information that President Reagan got. So as Chief of Staff, Don Regan did not appreciate the importance of courting members of Congress, of feeding the beast, I mean the press, talking with the press, uh, or being sensitive to the concerns of Nancy Reagan, uh, and James Baker was a master at all three of those things. 
Regan always wanted to be in the limelight, take credit for administration uh, successes, be in every photo op, and so forth. Nancy Reagan observed, Reagan liked the, so Reagan liked the sound of chief, but not of staff. He, uh, she also started calling him the chief of chaff. Uh, and when you, when you irritate Nancy in, in the White House, you're in, in deep trouble. Reagan's, uh, Reagan's domination of the White House culminated in the disaster of Iran-Contra. The Tower Commission concluded that his failure allowed uh, Iran-Contra to, uh, to occur. They said, quote, he must bear primary responsibility for the chaos that, defended, that, that descended upon the White House. Okay, so, so that's President Reagan's simple uh, and optimistic management philosophy worked well when he had good staffers, but resulted in disaster when he had poor staffers. Turning to national security, uh, a, a couple of uh, comments on the bombing of the Marine barracks in, in, in Lebanon, the Iran-Contra affair, and the end of the Cold War. In August of 1982, uh, Ronald Reagan sent Marines into Lebanon as part of a peacekeeping, keep peacekeeping force to prevent f further violence between the Israel uh, and the PLO. This, of course, was a very difficult uh, sort of thing to do. Uh, U.S. Uh, Marines were caught in the middle. Uh, and finally, in October of 1983, a suicide bomber drove a truck into the Marine barracks uh, in October and uh, killed 241 Marines. Now, of course, Reagan uh, was appalled at this, and he was determined that the United States would not be intimidated by the attack. <coughs> Uh, and despite advice from Weinberger to withdraw troops, uh, he said, said, Reagan said that uh, withdrawal would, quote, strip every ounce of meaning and purpose from their courageous sacrifice. But after a few months, uh, public opinion began to change and internal pressure in the White House, especially from the Pentagon, uh, uh, convinced Ronald Reagan that it was uh, uh, that he, it was better to play it safe and withdraw the Marines. But even on February 4th, the week before the Marines were withdrawn, Ronald Reagan referred to withdrawing the Marines as, quote, surrender and cutting and running. And he said, if we do that, we'll be sending the, the, the signal to the terrorists everywhere they can gain by, they can gain by waging war against innocent uh, people. But Ronald Reagan had a way of coming to terms with military and political reality, which was that conditions on the ground had changed uh, in Lebanon and that there was no clear military mission for the Marines. The next week, he withdrew the Marines uh, from Lebanon. The Iran-Contra affair uh, demonstrated, I think, the downside of Reagan's detachment, detached leadership style, as well as his vulnerability to the personal appeals of the families uh, of, of the hostages. Uh, in short, uh, Ronald Reagan decided to send arms to Iran in exchange for freeing uh, U.S. Uh, hostages. Now, Reagan had always uh, opposed negotiating with terrorists, and as late as June uh, 1985, when the negotiations were going on to set this up, uh, Reagan said, America will never make concessions to terrorists. Uh, to do so would only invite more terrorism. Once we head down that path, there would be no end to it. So George Schultz was against this. Casper uh, Weinberger said uh, that this would violate the Arms Export Control Act, but Ronald Reagan said, you know, the American people would just never forgive me if I fail to get these hostages out over this legal question. <clears throat> so Iran got some, uh, got some arms. Some of the hostages release were released, but other hostages were taken. So that was the Iran side of Iran-Contra. But the Contra side, I think, was more uh, problematical. Reagan was convinced that the Sandinista government in Nicaragua was a threat to the United States, uh, and so he wanted to send U.S. aid to the Contra insurgents. Uh, no, no problem with that, except uh, that Congress disagreed and passed a law forbidding the United States from aiding the Contras. So Lieutenant Colonel uh, Oliver North decided to divert some of the funds from Iran that were paying for the arms uh, to send them directly to the Contras by setting up uh, 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 financial um, accounts in, in Switzerland. But this secret attempt uh, to fund the Contras uh, was in direct violation of public law and a serious threat to the Constitution. The President's aides decided that what they could not achieve through the public constitutional process uh, that they would accomplish through secret illegal means, and there was no, no, no doubt about what the law prohibited. Now, there's nothing sinister about Reagan's concern for the Contras, uh, but his concern set a tone in the White House that allowed his staffers uh, or led his staffers to break the law. Now, what saved President Reagan here from impeachment proceedings, which uh, John Tower was worried about, James Baker was worried about, Nancy Reagan was worried about, was that there was no evidence that President Reagan knew about the diversion of funds to the Contras before it happened. In addition, 
uh, Reagan did not stonewall uh, the investigations. Uh, he established the Tower Board to investigate the matter. Uh, he brought in Special Counsel David Abshire to the White House to make sure that there was not any cover-up. And he, refu he refused to uh, claim executive uh, privilege. Thus, President Reagan salvaged his presidency from what might have been far worse uh, consequences. One of his greatest historic accomplishments, of course, was uh, his role uh, in the end of the, of the uh, Cold War. Reagan began his administration with declarations that the Soviet Union was an evil empire, uh, that its struggle with the West was a confrontation of, of good versus evil. But when uh, Mikhail Gorbachev came to power, Reagan recognized significant difference be differences between him uh, and the three previous Soviet pro uh, premiers during his presidency. And at the Reykjavik summit uh, in, in October 1986, he and Gorbachev, to the dismay of their national security advisors, almost came to an agreement to eliminate all nuclear weapons. The only sticking point was that Ronald Reagan insisted on the Strategic Defense Initiative, uh, uh, the SDI, uh, and Gorbachev would not go along with it. So they were very close, at least to that agreement, at, uh, at, at their level. And so the uh, Reykjavik summit seemed to be a failure, but actually it was a turning point uh, because the two leaders uh, learned that they could have, that they had some common ideals and they might be able to work together uh, in the future. Now, American conservatives were not excited about this at all. They thought that Reagan was out of his depth uh, and he's jeopardizing U.S. Uh, national security. Uh, Richard Nixon said, never let Reagan alone in a home, in a, in a room uh, with Mikhail Gorbachev. Uh, and, and so the conservatives were upset. Uh, but under uh, Gorbachev's leadership, the Soviet Union changed irrevocably. Uh, he withdrew Soviet troops from Afghanistan. He initiated glasnost and perestroika. He got rid of his hawkish military leadership. Uh, he refused to intervene militarily in Eastern Europe. Uh, and he cooperated with President Reagan to wind down uh, the Cold War. So the changes that Gorbachev set in motion in combination with economic decay uh, made the collapse of the Soviet Union in, in, inevitable. Uh, it was ultimately, it was brought down by its own internal contradictions, but the timing and the lack of bloodshed made po was made possible by Reagan, uh, President Reagan and his relationship with Mikhail Gorbachev. At Reagan's last meeting with Gorbachev in Moscow, he, he was asked by a news person, do you still think you're in an even, e evil empire? And Reagan said, no. I was talking about another time and another era. Thus, Ronald Reagan's greatest contribution to world peace came not through military confrontation, but through the personal, uh, his personal aversion to nuclear war uh, and his personal relationship with Mikhail Gorbachev. So in conclusion, uh, just as Reagan's presidency was marked by paradoxes, so his legacies to us are, are mixed. Uh, at, the pres at the personal level, he was unfailingly gracious and kind uh, to everybody. Uh, yet he had few close friends. James Baker said, quote, he is the kindest and most impersonal man I ever knew. <laughs> Martin Anderson said that he was a warmly ruthless man. So Ronald Reagan was wonderful to everybody, uh, but fewer uh, close friends, except of course for his wife, Nancy. Uh, in public uh, uh, policy, he was a foe of big government and public spending, except on defense, which he pushed uh, uh, and spent a lot on. Uh, his anti-tax convictions are now uh, now dominate the Republican Party despite his tax increases in 1981 and 1983. Uh, in foreign policy, uh, he presented the United States as a strong uh, opponent to communism, uh, but his initial hostility was tra uh, transformed into a productive re uh, relationship with Gorbachev, leading to the end of the Cold War, uh, a, a historic achievement. With respect to the office of the presidency, uh, with his initial policy victories, he demonstrated that the presidency was manageable uh, after a string of very problematic presidencies. Uh, but with respect to the Constitution, he allowed his subordinates to break the law and did not, quote, take care that the laws be faithfully executed. Thus, the paradoxes of Ronald Reagan's presidency remain with us. He was a master at politics, and his optimistic appeals uh, to fundamental values revived the American spirit. He demonstrated that the presidency was manageable. He led the United States towards a different perspective on Russia and helped pave the way to the end of the Cold War. Yet along the way, he condoned his aides breaking the law and under, uh, undermined constitutional accountability. Uh, in celebrating President Reagan's impressive achievements, we must also recognize the flaws in his presidential leadership. Thank you. I want to thank uh, Professor uh, Piffner for his wonderful start to our discussion and turn things over 
to Professor Michael Genovese. Thank you for joining us. Well, good afternoon, and uh, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me here. It's been uh, a while since I've been back to USC. It's always a pleasure also to share a platform with Jim Fifner, a uh, consummate gentleman, consummate scholar, and uh, his paper, as all of his work, was balanced, fair-minded, and thoughtful. Um, and in his paper and in his presentation, Jim talked a bit about the paradoxical nature of Reagan's presidency, and I want to pick up on that, but I want to reconceptualize it a bit for you. Um, and ask how ought we to think about the Reagan legacy and the Reagan presidency. And I think we need to view Ronald Reagan uh, in two very different but related ways. One Ronald Reagan as a leader and one Ronald Reagan as a president. And we need to separate those two out and if we do I think we can, we can see that, uh, that this, uh, this separation between leader and president helps us understand Ronald Reagan both as a man and as a president. And what I'd like to argue is that Ronald Reagan was an important, effective, and successful leader, but a, a considerably less effective and less successful president. He was the important leader of an important social movement at which he succeeded tremendously, but his presidency contained certain victories, but also certain deep flaws. And so in a way, this is going to be a tale of two Reagans, but there's going to be an ironic twist at the end. First of all, Ronald Reagan as leader. His skill set and his training well suited Reagan to the task of leadership. And he led a conservative movement because he was charismatic, persuasive, able to move an audience. He articulated a clear and compelling vision. He communicated that vision with great uh, effectiveness. He mobilized a cadre of followers who marched behind him in that movement. He inspired with his aspirational images and messages, who can forget his morning in America, uh, shining city on the hill speeches. So he was able to motivate, he was able to set a direction and get people to move behind that vision. The modern conservative movement is the Reagan movement. At that he was quite successful. However, being president requires a related but somewhat different set of skills. Policy development, management of people and processes, implementation, judgment, staff coordination and control. Here we see some of the clear deficiencies in Ronald Reagan, many of which that Jim points out in his paper and pointed out in his presentation. These problems, these deficiencies would come back to haunt Reagan, his party, our nation and the conservative movement. And so let's move now to Reagan as president. Reagan's lax leadership was discussed by, by Jim, how he overdelegated, was not always on top of his own administration, inattention to detail and implementation, etc. The most obvious and dramatic consequence of this, as Jim points out, was the Iran Contra scandal. But for Ronald Reagan, the leader, his deficiencies as president proved even more problematic, and this leads us to the ironic twist. Because of his leadership skills, they enabled him to do things as president that ended up undermining his conservative movement and its beliefs. What do I mean by that? Ronald Reagan, quite ironically given his conservative message, turned out to be not a small government conservative, but a big government activist. He was a president not in the conservative mold, but in the New Deal mold. There we see then the two Reagans, and those two Reagans were in conflict. Ronald Reagan and the growth of big government sounds unusual, sounds surprising. Yes, absolutely, he was. The evidence is unmistakably clear, and we must follow the evidence. And so while it may seem surprising that Ronald Reagan contributed mightily to the rise of big government and the big presidency, the evidence points in that direction. You'll remember Ronald Reagan rose in the aftermath of the failed presidency of Jimmy Carter. Carter would talk about living with less and turning down your thermostats, a message that didn't uh, suit the American public, nor did it suit Ronald Reagan. He rejected that message and turned it on its head. He unleashed the American people, their enterprise, their spirit. But he also 
contributed to the buy, buy, spend, spend, borrow, borrow culture that was developing at that time. Uh, in effect, we were driving ourselves to the poorhouse, but in a beautiful new car, built in Germany or Japan, and paid for on credit. In 1980, as a candidate, Ronald Reagan did not call for Americans to tighten their belt, to make peace with limitations and limited resources. No, it was full speed ahead. Don't settle for less. And yet, while he made a show of constantly decrying and complaining about big spending government, in 1980 during the campaign he said, for decades we have piled deficit upon deficit, mortgaging our future and our children's future for the temporary convenience of the present. To continue this long trend is to guarantee tremendous social, cultural, political, and economic upheavals. A good point. And he vowed to put America's house in order, he said. You and I as individuals can, by borrowing, live beyond our means, but only for a limited period of time. Why then should we think that collectively, as a nation, we're not bound by the same limitation? Reagan reiterated that message time and time again and promised that he would, quote, check and reverse the growth of government. And yet, as president, he would do just the opposite. During the Carter years, the federal deficit averaged $54.5 billion annually. 54.5. During the Reagan era, deficits averaged $210.6 billion. Overall, federal, federal spending nearly doubled from $590.9 billion in 1980 to $1.4 trillion in 89. The federal government did not shrink. It increased in the eight years of the Reagan presidency, swelling by 5%. Well, you might ask, well, what about the big tax cut in 1981? Indeed, there was a huge tax cut in 81, but as Jim points out, the very next year, the largest tax increase in peacetime history with the Orwellian title that Jim mentioned, the Tax Equity and Fiscal Responsibility Act of 1982. Reagan then signed tax increases in 83, 84, and 86. Budget cuts? No, the budget increased under Reagan. He never even submitted a balanced budget to Congress. Balanced budgets out the window. He did increase military spending, but that's bigger government again, and didn't curb government spending. So the consequences of this for the Reagan revolution are profound, because they lead one to the conclusion that, in point of fact, there was no Reagan revolution. What we call the Reagan revolution was really an extension of New Deal big spending and big government under a different flag and by a different tribe. Rhetoric notwithstanding, Reagan talked a magnificent game of conservative rhetoric, but during the 1980s, both parties became big government parties. Reagan spoke like a conservative, but acted like a big government New Deal big spender. Well, thus the ironic twist is that Ronald Reagan as a leader was at war with Ronald Reagan, the president. The small government conservative rhetoric of Reagan, the leader, called on the nation to move in one direction, the big spending, big government, Ronald Reagan as president, actually moved the country in another direction. In effect, he was guilty of the very sins he had spent his uh, 10 years or so building a conservative movement around con and condemning those same argu arguments and ideas. And so in the end, what are we to make of the two Ronald Reagans, the conservative rhetoric, big government actions, an important leader, a paradoxical president? All presidents are flawed. All presidential legacies are mixed. And I think we do a disservice to the nation when we worship false idols. Better to face and confront the real Reagan, strengths and weaknesses, successes and failures, rather than construct a monument built on sand. It is entirely appropriate to celebrate Ronald Reagan the leader as we criticize Ronald Reagan the president. Better when honoring Ronald Reagan that we honor the real Reagan and not worship a false idol. Thank you for your very kind indulgence. Michael, thank you. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to, for someone based in Sacramento like myself, and to hear people who still recall the governorship of, President, of Ronald Reagan, it's qu we're quite an honor to have someone here today who served with him uh, as governor in that transition period and uh, in his presidency. So welcome Peter Hannaford, and very glad you could join us here today.
Thank you, Rich, and <coughs> ladies and gentlemen. Um, both Jim and Michael have given us uh, very interesting and provocative presentations. I'd like to turn the clock back, however, to um, talk about uh, Ronald Reagan as governor of California and how what he knew and learned in that process um, had a bearing upon how he behaved as president. Um, January 1967, Sacramento. He had just been inaugurated as the 33rd governor of the state. He commanded a staff of about 105 people in the governor's office and uh, presided over a state government, which was the second largest public entity in the United States, that had about 10 or 12,000 employees. Now, he'd been the um, president of the Screen Actors Guild for three terms, nearly six years, and they had a small staff, but that was the extent of his management experience. There wasn't any other. However, he had several other assets. He had honed his communication skills very effectively over the years. He developed negotiating skills uh, as the president of, the, of SAG against uh, some very hard-headed movie, movie, movie moguls, such as Jack Warner. He would also developed a very clear idea of the role of the state's government, which is to provide, he said, essential services efficiently and economically to keep taxes and costs under control and to cut undue regulation so that the state's economy could grow. He also knew a lot about human nature by that time. Uh, he'd had several careers, radio, film, the Screen Actors Guild presidency, television, a host of the GE program, and, and more importantly, for his political development, his, its spokesman throughout the country. He also knew something about poverty and how poor people reacted to things. Looking back on his childhood, he said, we were pretty poor, but so was everyone else we knew, so we didn't think of ourselves as poor. From the combination of all of his experiences, he devised a simple but effective management method. It had three elements. One, to find the job to be done. Two, pick the right person to do it. And three, let him or her do the job. Now, with very few exceptions, it worked very well for him. You've heard in the earlier presentation about at least one exception that was quite important in Washington. But in Sacramento, it worked virtually without exception. And other than stating his objectives, he rarely instructed the people he appointed on how to go about the work they were supposed to do. He was self-confident, and he was showing his appointees that he had confidence in them. And the result is nearly all of them worked very hard to justify what they believed were his expectations and were very loyal to him. Now, on his desk in the governor's office, uh, he put a plaque, which he later took to Washington, and it said, there is no limit to what a man can do or where he can go if he doesn't mind who gets the credit. Now, if that were being written today, he, he would have added the word woman as well as man. But this plaque reflected Reagan's personal modesty on the one hand and on the other his willingness to let the sun shine on others. It was also very canny of him, for if someone working for him got widespread credit for doing a good job, it reflected back on the judgment of the person who had made the appointment, which was Reagan. Now, his personal schedule reflected this management style. His belief was that the work of the day should be finished at about 5 o'clock, and he would pack up his briefcase and go home to his family. And he wanted to use this personal example to, in effect, tell his staff that he did not expect them to work till the late hours of the night. The work would still be there the next morning. He knew that someone who worked extremely long hours day after day after day would be tired, stamina would be sapped, and worse, um, he or she would have very little time for spouses and family, and he thought that was all very important. So he kept to that schedule. After dinner each evening, he'd spent time with, with uh, his wife and, and kids, uh, he would read the contents of his briefcase so that he was fully up to speed with everything the next day. And I'll say as a personal aside, the um, 
first or second day, I went to work in the governor's office. Uh, one of my colleagues, we had offices side by side with a shared secretary in between, said to me, be very careful what you send to his inbox because he thinks anything that's in the inbox is important. And he will not only read it, he will probably be able to tell you all about it the next morning and fully brief you on what its contents were. So we had to be very careful what in the in went into the inbox. Nothing uh, frivolous or unimportant or irrelevant to what he was dealing with. In his cabinet meetings in Sacramento, he made sure that all views on a particular issue were fully aired. Everybody had a say from cabinet members, senior staff members, and technicians, technical experts who were brought in to answer technical questions and make presentations. Now, he never ended a session by asking for a show of hands because he knew that he had to make the decision. Sometimes he'd say, um, I've heard enough. Here's what we're going to do. And he'd describe his decision. Other times he'd say, I'd like to, like to read some more of the background material on this tonight and we'll take it up at the next meeting and make the decision then. When tension built up over a particularly hot issue, he had two ways to relieve it. Uh, one was to stop the argumentation with a joke, of which he had a very large supply, and the other was to pass a jar of jelly beans around the table. And invariably, this took the steam out of the room, and everything calmed down, and they got back, got the argument back, or the discussion back on, on track. Now, I mentioned earlier he had these well-developed um, abilities to communicate and to negotiate. I'll give you one example. In 1970, he had established a, or assembled a team of experts to develop a welfare reform plan. And California was becoming the nation's welfare capital at that point. The roles were growing so rapidly that it actually was threatening the state's budget. When the plan was ready, Governor Reagan asked the legislature if he could make an appearance uh, uh, before the a joint session of the two houses to introduce the plan. Well, both of these were controlled by the other party, and they both said no. Um, they, they thus underestimated him, as so many others had before and since. Well, this didn't daunt him a bit. Um, he took the issue on the road. He gave speeches and interviews up and down the state. Finally, one day, the late Bob Moretti, who was then the Speaker of the Assembly, walked into his office with his hands up in mock surrender, and he said, stop those cards and letters. Let's talk. <laughs> so the two of them entered into a series of uh, negotiating sessions and came up with regis legislation that was passed. Well, Reagan considered this a victory, and he explained later, anytime I can get 70% of what I want, as I did with the welfare reform, from a hostile legislature, I'll take it. I figure I would do well enough with that that I could go back later and get some more. Now this showed a man who understood in the realm of politics how to compromise. He wasn't compromising any principles, but you could pro compromise on certain procedures, and you had to give something to get something. This stood him in very good stead over the years. Well, looking back on Reagan's long career, we see several characteristics that contributed to his mature outlook on managing people and government. And those characteristics are optimism, determination, modesty, loyalty, tolerance, self-reliance, self-confidence, good humor, and reverence for God. And broadly, these characteristics came from the environment of the rural Middle West where he grew up. More specifically, they came from his forebears who had settled in northwestern Illinois in the mid-19th century, from his parents, Jack and Nell Reagan, from his teachers, his coaches, athletic and dramatic, from clergy and others who served as mentors to him over the years. Well, as young people do, he had unconsciously absorbed what he admired from each of these people and integrated it into his own personality, which was fully formed by the time he got his first job. So the result of all of this was an unusually effective leader. Thank you. Now for our initial round of comments, uh, Ralph Bledsoe.
Uh, Rich left one thing out of my uh, bio sketch earlier. I was also the first cemetery director for Ronald Reagan. <clears throat> now, I got to tell you a story behind that. The, uh, for you young people, and maybe some of you older ones uh, more likely, <clears throat> everyone who dies in the state of California has to be buried in a cemetery. Now, when I was uh, the director at the Reagan Library, the Reagans decided they wanted to be buried at their presidential library. A few of our presidents are, by the way, and so the Reagans wanted to be also. So the lawyer uh, for the foundation staff called Sacramento. They said, well, that's fine, but you've got to have a cemetery to bury them in. So he said, well, we don't have a cemetery. Well, you've got to get one specified. You've got to go to the county, Ventura County. You've got to have a, a, a cemetery outlined, and then, uh, you know, we'll consider it. So they did. They went to the, to the uh, uh, county board there, and the board approved it because they, of course, liked having the library in their county there. And so uh, we called to Sacramento. Okay, we've got the, uh, the uh, cemetery decided. Well, every cemetery has to have a director. <laughs> so at, at the board meeting where this was mentioned, all eyes turned to me. And I said, well, wait a minute, I'm a federal employee. All libraries are run by federal employees. So I said, I have to call Washington to see if I can take this job. So I called our general counsel, and he said, well, if you don't get paid for it, you can take the job. So I said, okay, fine, that sounds fine. So we called to Sacramento, and they said, okay, Ralph's going to be the new cemetery director for our approved cemetery. Okay, good. He has to take a test. <laughs> and so I called up to the cemetery director. I said, what kind of test does the cemetery director take? He said, I'll send you a copy of the law. You read sections 2, 5, 7, and 8. And he said, you'll be able to pass the test. I said, okay. So they sent me the law, and they scheduled a test, and I went to the Ronald Reagan State Office Building in downtown Los Angeles to take this test. Now, I was taking this test. I was the only cemetery director test taker in that day. <laughs> but at the other end of the same room, they were having a Spanish to English exam orally. <laughs> now, so I took this test. This test had 25 true-false questions, and it had 50 matching questions. Okay, so I did my thing, whatever I thought it, uh, the right answer was in all these. And so I sent in my exam. Well, a couple of weeks later, they called down. They said, you passed. And I said, good. I said, what was my score? They said, you passed. <laughs> and I asked about the score again. You passed again. So anyway, we, I finally announced that to the Reagan Foundation. Then the next week, I got a letter from President Reagan said, Dear Ralph, congratulations on passing your most recent examination. However, I must insist that you not use those skills anytime soon. <laughs> so I wrote him a letter back, and I said, Dear Mr. President, thank you for your congratulatory note to me. I fully do not intend to use those skills, but I need your utmost cooperation. <laughs> so there's, there maybe is what I'm most famous for. But I want to talk a little bit more about Ronald Reagan, because you've heard a lot about uh, some of his times as president and so forth. And I want to really start before he became president, well before, and then take it up through there. Because as part of the library, uh, as you may know, we cover the early lives. All presidential libraries do this. And so Ronald Reagan, you have to look at who he was. Uh, he was born in a small town in Illinois. His mother was a very religious person, very devout. His father was an alcoholic. His father had a little difficulty uh, uh, holding jobs and moved around quite a bit, but both parents taught him about the concerns for people and being tolerant of people. And so he learned that at a very early age. But he also learned he had to be pretty independent as a young man too, because his father many times was not available uh, when he should have been perhaps as a parent. And so Ronald Reagan did. He, he became uh, the president of his uh, his student body at, as a senior class president in high school. He took a job as a lifeguard there. He worked his way through Eureka College setting tables after he'd graduated from high school. Interesting story about Eureka. And I'll, I'll tell a few Reagan stories as we go, but uh, uh, Ronald Reagan graduated from Eureka College. He played football there, and he graduated with a degree in economics. Well, when he was president, he goes back to get an honorary degree in economics. He said, I think the first time I got it was honorary. <laughs> so he would make fun of himself in many ways. And by the way, on the cemetery, he also one day came out to the library and said, Ralph, how's the cemetery going, or how's the construction around the gravesite going? I said, oh, pretty good. You want to go look at it? 
He said, yeah, I want to go lie down and see what kind of view I'm going to have. <laughs> now, that, that you know, I knocked me over, of course, but he wanted to, and he does have a nice view of the ocean uh, out there and so forth, but there, there are a lot of other aspects of that job that I don't want to talk about. Um, let, me, let me, though, uh, again, thank USC for doing this, for uh, honoring uh, uh, Ronald Reagan on his 100th birthday coming up this Sunday. Uh, and I thank uh, you for inviting me because it was nice to come back to the campus. The campus was very special to me and, and uh, so was this president. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about, uh, first of all, what Jim and, and Michael have said about his transition. Uh, I studied transitions a little bit too. Jim, to some extent, the, tra the success of our transition really depended on the previous transition. The, the Ford to Carter uh, transition was done extremely well. President Ford, as you remember, was, uh, had to go through some healing. Remember, he pard pardoned President Nixon and so forth. So President Ford uh, pr made sure that his agencies and departments, and I dealt with a lot of them at the Federal Executive Institute, made sure they prepared transition papers so that the incoming administration would be well, well served and know uh, what kind of committees they were going to have to deal with, who the important congressmen were, what, what the important constituent groups were that the agency would have to deal with, and so forth. So that transition was successful. They carried it forward to us. The Carter people were very good about the, uh, preparing our people, as our transition teams, as they went into uh, the different agencies to determine what went on there. White House, a little different. We found a few fish, pizza things behind radiators and a few things like that. Not quite as many as they, the Bush people found with all the W's taken off of the, uh, the typewriters, but that, you know, that's, <laughs> agency transition went good. Let me suggest to you, though, if you want to look at transitions, look at the one going on in Egypt today. Uh, there's a transition going on there. Look at the one in, in uh, Tunisia or Yemen. Look at the transition that took place in Iraq or the transition that took place in Iran. Then when you look at those and all, a lot of the rest of the countries in the world and you look at our transitions of power, those are important differences, I think, to accept in our culture here. So, so on the transition, Jim, I think uh, that uh, uh, the, we, we benefited a lot from the others. As far as the first term and the second term staff that you mentioned, absolutely, uh, I think you're right. We had three people in the first term as chief of staff, uh, Jim Baker, and Ed Meese, who was the counselor, and Mike Deaver, who took care of the president's person. And I, I stress that because for every president, there needs to be somebody who can handle their personal affairs and their personal relationships, et cetera. Not just the first lady. It has to be somebody else in there that helps. And Mike Deaver was excellent at that. And my view is that had the first team in the first term been around in the second term, we wouldn't have had the third issue take place. The third issue being the Iran-Contra and so forth. But uh, it did take place. Our first uh, team was not there in the second team. It took place. Ronald Reagan stepped up. He, he took uh, responsibility for it. Reported, he investigated it, first of all, to make sure that there were laws broken. And when he concluded they were broken, he, took, he stepped up and he said laws were broken during my time. And uh, so you've got to give him, to some extent, credit for that, because the leaders have to take advantage and, and take uh, responsibility for the kinds of things their subordinates do. And Ronald Reagan was that kind of a person. Um, the, uh, let, me, let me say one thing. Peter's told you a little bit about his time as governor and his time as, as president of Screen Actors Guild. He was going through a learning process. And for many of you, I think this is the most important executive skill a person can develop, is how to learn from what they experience in time. And he did learn from all of those. Learned how to deal with adversaries, those studio bosses, those unions he had to deal with in the Screen Actors Guild, and so forth. With Bob Moretti in the state legislature there in Sacramento, which helped him deal with Tip O'Neill, who was of the different party in Congress, so that they would interact with one another, and they might not be friends in the day, but after five o'clock, they could have a beer together. Every St. Patrick's Day, the two of them were down at one of the local pubs there in Washington to celebrate uh, uh, that event and so forth. So Ronald Reagan learned, and I think his ability to learn was one of the, th the things we can really look at. Now, let, this is a, 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 a symposium, it's an academic symposium. I'm a little more of a pracademic. I was in industry before I did my graduate work and 
went back into it later uh, for a while. But then I also enjoyed teaching at the Federal Executive Institute where we dealt with executives. But let me tell you about being an executive. I want to take those two words, executive and leadership, separate them, then bring them back together. Being an executive. Some of these people who would come into FEI, Chet Newland can attest to this, would say, I'm not an executive. Why am I here trying to learn how to be an executive? I'm a general counsel in the Small Business Administration, or I run a laboratory over in the National Institutes of Health or whatever. They'd say, you guys are just building up you know, your own resumes uh, saying that you deal with executives in the federal government. And then they would say, and by the way, you know, we have PhDs and you have PhDs. What do you think you're going to teach us? And our response is, we're not sure we can teach you much, but we have high hopes you can still learn something. <laughs> so, so learning became the key to what we were trying to do. And I think that's the key to executive behavior is learn how to learn. And we spent a lot of time with these executives, so to speak, at FEI, teaching them how they learn. And these are people in their 50s, 60s, and 70s who manage billions of dollars worth of, uh, of programs, et cetera. So Ronald Reagan's learning was uh, one of the things that more important. Now let's look at, at leadership. Uh, I remember two, two statements about leadership. One by Peter Drucker. Peter Drucker was a well-known uh, scholar in, uh, about leadership and management and so forth. And Drucker said, well, says, you know, we, we were trying to find out uh, what really made great leaders and after years and years of studying the traits of leaders, we had to throw out all of our theories because we found the only thing leaders have in common are followers. In other words, if there aren't many people following, there's not much leadership really going on. The other was uh, Mahatma Gandhi, and I'm sure some of you have heard this one, uh, who was once heard to say, there go my people, I must follow them for I am their leader. So he had a great respect, and I think by Ronald Reagan, picked up on both of these because if you look at his traits, you know, a kid growing up in a small town, uh, a movie actor, uh, and finally the governor, but who would have thought that, uh, you know, he would become a uh, president uh, that we would all uh, be honoring here now and who I think is considered uh, to be one of, our, one of our very, very good presidents. I only have two great presidents, by the way. Uh, my two great presidents are Washington and Lincoln because those two were president at a time when this country might not have existed. Washington set the pace on being a civilian type of president and so forth, so I give him credit for that. Lincoln brought us together, so I give him credit for that. All the rest of them are, are, may fall in different categories that the scholars may want to put them into, but uh, I would say Ronald Reagan ends up in a very good uh, place. He also ends up as a modern president, too. And let me suggest to you that modern presidents are a lot different because as executives, they are responsible for huge conglomerates. Things that happened, let me mention the 1930s because that's uh, uh, something else scholars can pick up on. 1932, Ronald Reagan cast his first vote for president. He turned 21 that year. He voted for Franklin Roosevelt. Another little story, Franklin, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, of course, has a library in Hyde Park, New York. Ronald Reagan gave a fundraising speech for that, uh, that presidential library. He said, some of you may wonder why I, a, uh, a Republican president, am doing a fundraiser for a Democratic president. But he said, as I look around the room, I think I'm the only person in the room who voted for Franklin Roosevelt four times. <laughs> and so that's how he felt about that. But then he said, of course, the party, the, the, uh, the Democratic Party didn't, uh, I didn't leave it, the party left me. So he was a, a fan of, of uh, Franklin Roosevelt, but he certainly had different ideas about how he would govern, and uh, that's to his credit to a great extent. Uh, now, let me shift a little bit to the, his presidency. I brought along a copy of the Constitution. You know what the Constitution said? First of all, I, used, I teach a class in Charlottesville for senior citizens, 60s, 70s, 80s. I've had some 90-year-olds in my class. I always start by asking them a question. Do you know which article of the Constitution outlines the duties and responsibilities of the president? I get all kinds of different answers. Everybody know? Article 2. What do you think Article 1 deals with? The Congress. So the whole thing goes in how they're selected, how they get there, how they're supposed to do their thing, and so forth. Article 2 then says, and it, and it starts with, and I'll quote from it here, the executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States of America. 
That's the first time the word executive is used. It's only used one other time in Article 2 where they talk about the executive departments that are under the president. The word leadership is never mentioned in Article 2 of the Constitution. But Article 2 sets aside what a president really does. And if you look very carefully at what Article 2 says here, you will wonder why anybody would ever want that job. It starts off, he's commander in chief. And then it goes into, he's also the person who is uh, responsible for uh, appointing ambassadors and other people who will represent us in the world of nations, which means he's the chief of state. He's the sole sp spokesperson for this country in dealing with the heads of all the other countries. Anytime there's a summit involving the leaders of all the world, our president is the one who speaks for him. It also means he's chief executive officer of one of the most god-awful uh, organizations one would want to manage, the federal government. I just want to talk a little bit about each of these three because you know a little bit about his history, but I want to tell you some more. Commander-in-Chief, on, on January 20th at noon when a president takes office, that president becomes head of the most awesome military capability ever assembled. And there's, there's a, a ritual there called the passing of the football. Now the football, of course, contains the nuclear codes which a president can, uh, only a president can use to, to cause the uh, use of, of very, very destructive weapons and so forth. So that, pr that, that person on January 20th, when they take responsibility for that, now have the weight of the world really uh, on their shoulders. Now they also uh, are the boss of a lot of people who may not know anything about them. And they may not know a lot about those people either. We've had some recent presidents, of course, who have not been in the military and so forth. Ronald Reagan was in the military, in the Army Air Corps, spent his whole time here in Hollywood. If you haven't seen that movie on how to recognize a Japanese zero, you got to watch it. <laughs> Ronald Reagan was superb in that movie. So. But uh, he, did, he did have various kinds of uh, feelings for the military. And one of the concerns was that the, a lot of the airplanes wouldn't fly, a lot of the tanks wouldn't run, a lot of the, the soldiers were not well equipped, et cetera. So he decided he was going to take this on as a major responsibility. One of the reasons, by the way, the budgets started going up is he did want to increase defense spending. Peace through strength was one of his major concerns, and he was going to take on the rest of the world, make sure we were not number two. Of course, we were fighting, remember, we say we weren't in a war, but there was something called the Cold War, and that was that affinity that he had for the Soviet Union there. He'd called them the evil empire, so his views about them were already well known. He, he really developed his uh, antipathies toward uh, communism as head of the Screen Actors Guild, because a lot of the, the unions were becoming communistic. They were trying to take over the studios. In that capacity, he, uh, he had to work with the studio bosses in fighting against those unions, and at the same time, he was fighting with the studio bosses about the actors being able to move from one studio to another to do their pictures and so forth. So he learned uh, from that experience, you know, how to deal with those kind of situations. Well, there are all kinds of things I could say about uh, his, his commander-in-chief responsibilities and how he took those up, but I think uh, that overall the, the uh, military people respected him and so forth. He used the military a few times. A few times he may not have used them uh, as they, he might have, but uh, I think those things are, are well covered. Let me take the most important job, though, that's articulated in, artic in Article Two of the Constitution, the Chief of State. I used to say I would hated to have given Ronald Reagan a test when he took office on January 20th to name all the countries in the world, all their forms of governance the heads of all of those, those countries, any kind of past relationships the United States had with all those countries, et cetera. And yet here he is now, the person who's responsible for our foreign policy and our national security policy. Uh, in interestingly enough, if a new, for a new president, the first time they have the chance to meet with some of their counterparts is the economic summit that occurs every June and July and so forth. When we were there, I think it was a G7, now up to G20 or whatever. Uh, but uh, and the first one was in, in Ottawa. And Pierre Trudeau, who was the host, uh, was the Prime Minister of Canada, what is not exactly a friend to Ronald Reagan, and, uh, but he was the host. And so Reagan goes up there, and he used to tell us, he'd say, I just walked in the room, I said, hi, my name is Ron. And he'd go around and start introducing himself to those uh, people. That's how important it is that uh, a president become familiar with these other people 
and he can develop his own rapport as need be. No, uh, no doubt about the rapport he developed with Margaret Thatcher, whom he met at that meeting and so forth, and they became really uh, uh, close. Let me say something about the Soviet Union, though, because that's been mentioned several times. Uh, if you go to the Reagan Library, there's a, there used to be an exhibit there, I hope they still have it, which has a letter he wrote to each of the heads of the Soviet Union. Okay, when, it, when, when, Ron, when he took over, he said he hated this idea of mad, mutually uh, assisted des destruction, I guess, because we all had nuclear weapons and if we ever used them, you know, we were all done for. And he, get, he treated it that simply. He said, so I've got to work with those guys just like he worked with Bob Moretti, just like he worked with, with Tip O'Neill and so forth. He said, so he sent a letter off to Leonid Brezhnev. Brezhnev kind of uh, sloughed it off, didn't really respond through some diplomatic channels. He said, oh, we're not interested in getting together. So, uh, but as Soviet leaders in those days had a uh, tendency toward, he died. Okay, then uh, the Andropov, I think, was next in line here. I forget the exact sequence, but Andropov took over. Andropov was a KBG, KGB -er. And Andropov, uh, Reagan wrote to him and said, we need to get together, we need to talk. We're ahead of the two largest uh, uh, entities in the world. And so uh, Andropov, uh, by the time he was ready to respond, he died. And so the next came Chernenko. So Reagan wrote a letter to Chernenko. And Chernenko was thinking about it, then he died. <laughs> and so finally, here comes, here comes uh, Gorbachev. Now, I don't make light of this because he wrote a letter to each of those, and those letters were on display where he was saying, let's get together to talk about all of this. Because, you know, we are heads of the union, and of the, of the two largest powers in the world. And incidentally, uh, a, lot of, uh, point, a lot of points were made about Reagan wanted to m perhaps give away the store to this, this young Gorbachev. And a lot of the people were concerned that he might do it, but he used to wink to some of his uh, associates. And if you read something by Mike Deaver, who was with him a lot, and uh, by Jim Kuhn, you probably never heard of him, but he was the executive assistant, and he was always there with him. And uh, he would turn aside to them, and he said, don't worry, I know what I'm doing. He was not going to give away the store. The Star Wars, the SDI, Strategic Defense Initiative, was one way that he would always be able to say uh, to the others, uh, look, I'm going to develop this, uh, this initiative. They were frightened to death of that. So no matter that these, these heads of state always wondered what this cowboy was going to do when he took office. They had to have some respect for him. And, and as I say, on January 20th, when he becomes head, all of them want to come visit. So they all either send him an invitation for themselves to visit or for him to come visit them or whatever. See, they want to get to know him, and that's an important part of that. Uh, let me just real quickly go to the third responsibility I mentioned, the CEO, the chief executive officer. When he takes over office, he's uh, responsible for about four and a half million people. There's about two million, well, we had about 1.8, 1.9, two million people roughly in civilian employment, about 900,000 in the Postal Service. That might be going down. We had about a million and a half, a little more than that in the military. So if you add them up, there's about four and a half million. But our friend Paul Light, who used to work at the National Academy uh, with us, has done a study on the real size of government and he says, okay, let's add up all those state and local government employees who are on the federal payroll. Let's add up all those contractors. Let's add up, you know, all the, the grants given to people at universities, et cetera. Came to about 17 million. So when you look at the personnel, and those of you in business in the country, you know you deal with three, three of your resources, your people and your money and your property. Well, as, when it came to people, those were some of the kind of things he had to manage. He had other people that helped him manage them, but he got along pretty well with the career bureaucracy. Money, it's already been talked about. Sure, he wanted to, to uh, uh, increase the military and so forth. He wanted to make deals with Congress. Congress is not very easy to deal with. Presidents can offer cuts, or they can offer this, that, and the other. Congress uh, may or may not buy it and so forth. I'm not suggesting that uh, uh, Congress necessarily overwhelmed him because he wanted to build it up too. So he was not a, not a small government uh, uh, person in that sense, but he wanted government to do the right things. And so he went, took uh, Congress on head to head. But on the money situation, sure, we ended up with greater deficits and so forth. But my goodness, look at us today. Property, you gotta manage the property of the federal government. Federal government owns about a third of the land mass of the United, of the United States. You know, and so that's a lot of property that you got to deal with, about 750 million acres. We didn't even know how many acres or how much property the federal government owned when we took over. 
So he said, let's find out at least what we own. And so the General Services Administration, which is supposed to deal with this, uh, came up, well, okay, we have the inventory here of our properties. And we said, good, what do you have the White House located, uh, uh, valued at? There are 18 acres around the White House. Oh, $50,000. <laughs> the Washington Monument. How valuable is the Washington Monument? Okay, so, you know, you can see now in the property. But we did undertake a property initiative, one of which I headed also, as the Federal Property Review Board. We wanted to try to get rid of as much federal property as we could. States and locals would have been glad to take this because they'd get it onto the tax rolls, you know, the other way. So anyway, he had to do that. He developed a, the President's Council on Management uh, Improvement. He got the Assistant Secretaries for Administration and all the different agencies to come together from time to time at the White House and talk about how they could improve. He, got, he developed the President's Council on Integrity and Efficiency, got all the inspectors general together, and they came over to the White House. I was a member of both of those, those groups, and they were looking at ways to get at fraud, waste, and abuse. So he, he did take on the, as many of those as he could. Now, that, I'll just, I won't say anything at all about the last thing, which is not in the Constitution, but which, but which presidents have to be responsible for, and that's their political party. The way I phrase this is if you look at the out party, the party that doesn't have the presidency, and right now it's the Republicans, who's in charge of the Republican Party? Is it John McCain, their last nominee? Is it George W. Bush, their last president? Or George H. W. Bush, the one before that? You don't know who's in charge of the out party, but you darn sure know who's in charge of the in party. The President of the United States and the political party, in this case the Democratic National Committee, listens to the President of the United States and will follow in what they want to do. So the political part is it. Just to give you a final, I, I, did a, I do a scorecard on presidential responsibilities. I have the domestic, the national security, and the constitutional responsibilities, and I give them to my students to ask them to, to score how they think people are doing. I think if I did a scorecard on Ronald Reagan, I have to be positive. I think uh, he made us believe in America again, and I think he really did push the uh, shining city on the hill. So if you go see the movie out there, you'll see the end of the movie where he, he and Nancy are walking away. He said, I think we did pretty good. Again, thank you to all the panelists, to Jim for the paper. Now we'd like to do uh, some Q&A for the next 15 minutes. Uh, the way that this would be accomplished is, my understanding is there are some roving mics, and they will go up to someone who has a question. Now in our leadership programs, we talk about powerful inquiry driving powerful leadership. So we welcome a question. A question. Um, and if it's not forthcoming, I'll make an interpretation that turns into a question. <laughs> so we welcome that. And if you could identify who you are and uh, where you're from, that would be welcome. So um, do I see a hand coming up? I see two hands back there, either of those fine gentlemen. And we'll wait. Before you ask your question, let a mic come on up to you. And then we'll uh, ask each of the panelists. You should be mic'd up for that if you could turn on, on your mic. So uh, hold on, Mike, will, the sound system will come to you. Okay, I'll ask a poll panelist, what's the most famous word President Reagan say? Like John F. Kennedy say that, ask me why country can do for you, and uh, ask why you can do for your country. What's the best word uh, President Reagan say for generations to come? And Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay, could you give us your name and, and where? I'm sorry, I'm in Lee. I'm a Korean. I voted for four elections for you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, how about if we start with Peter, who knew him first? I'd say it's Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. I got a story on that one. <laughs> I, I took uh, President Reagan and Mr. Gorbachev around the library when Gorbachev came out to visit. Told them a little bit about what presidential libraries were all about. Raisa Gorbachev, his wife, said, oh, we couldn't have a, a library. We've given all of our stuff away. But she and Nancy Reagan uh, went their way, and they got along very nicely, by the way, regardless of what was said in the press. But I took Reagan and Gorbachev around. We got to a point at the library where there's a movie, uh, kind of a high-tech movie there, where Mr. Gorbachev tear down this wall. We have a bench in the front there. 
So I escorted him. When we got to that, I made sure the movie started. Mrs. Reagan told me, you better make sure that movie works. It was kind of a high-tech movie. So I seated them in the center where they could see it. And I sat down at the end so I could see them. And it got to that point, Mr. Gorbachev tear down this wall. Gorbachev's face didn't change. Then he turned to Reagan. Well, I did. <laughs> Michael. Uh, I, I think uh, Peter's right that uh, the tear down the wall line is the most memorable. But the wall is down. And so what is the most lasting line? And I think it's his oft-repeated phrase, government is not the solution to our problems. Government is the problem. You hear that all the time now from the, the Tea Party movement, for example. I've got a couple. Uh, but verify. But also, I just can't, uh, uh, when he, after he was shot, uh, he said, honey, I forgot to duck. And he also, he also said to the doctors at George Washington Hospital, I hope you're a Republican. Excellent. Wonderful question to start with. I see a hand all the way in the back in the last row there. Uh, uh, could you go to the right in the back row there, walk right up the middle, three rows, and make a left? I feel like a traffic cop. Uh, please, if you could state your name and uh, any affiliation. Um, I'm Jackie Matthews. That would be great. Who would like to start? Michael? Repeat the question. Ripley. Ripley. Oh, repeat the question. The uh, social interest of uh, President Reagan, he was a strong supporter of the Boy Scouts. He was interested in the American West. And so we, I take this as sort of a sociological, anthropological, and political question rolled into one. Is that a fair restatement? Absolutely. OK. Um, who would like to get started? Well, he, he, he of course, uh, I think, supported uh, Mrs. Reagan's view of of just saying no drugs. But it, interestingly enough, at the library, when we would have high school students come out, he would start talking to them about smoking, not smoking. And he would go through stories how his father was a chain smoker and that sort of thing. And so he was uh, very interested in uh, the student health, you might think. Other comments? good at relating to people in general. So his views, I think, of welfare were very harsh. Some of it uh, legitimate, but some of it, I think he could not uh, empathize with people that were poor. But if you're an individual, uh, uh, relate. Let me give you another one. People with disabilities. Uh, I was walking across the street going to the West Wing one day, and I saw this van pull up with these handicapped kids, about a dozen of them got out. And, and I looked on his schedule, and I saw that he had 15 minutes with a photo op on some sort of a, of a, uh, a program that they were involved with. The, minute, the meeting lasted about 45 minutes to 50 minutes. And I understand it was a very careful meeting. So I think dis people with disabilities were someone he uh, also uh, felt kindly toward. Michael? You know, I think uh, that point it really goes back to what Jim just said, that he probably was, and I think it's true, very empathetic in that one-on-one -on -one situation, and yet he cut funding for people with handicaps. And so you can see the duality of Ronald Reagan uh, played out in his, uh, the sense in which he cared about individuals, and then in the aggregate, it was, let's cut funding. Uh, I see a hand there, and then we'll go right there. So let us, the gentleman right in the back, and then we'll go right up to the front. Hi, how are you? Uh, my name is Stan Aplowski. I'm a master of public policy student school of school policy and planning development. Uh, my question is for Dr. Benavidi and for Dr. Kistner. I was wondering if you could uh, elaborate a little bit more on the idea that Reagan was the by the largest tax increase in American history. It seems, uh, I should confess, that I was one of those born after Reagan's first term. But it seems that um, in Reagan's first term as president, the top marginal tax rate dropped from 7% to 50%. And part in one of the uh, major stipulations of tax from 82 was a 3 to 1 ratio of spending cut to um, tax increases. So it seems that uh, President Reagan was more reacting to the political realities of the time of Democratic control of the House. 
of which all spending increases or spending provisions originate. So I was wondering um, if you might elaborate a little bit more about that. Well, I think Ronnie Reagan was pragmatic in that sense, but his, his rhetorical consistency uh, was that he was against taxes, and he kept saying it, and he kept saying it. But when he got to the point where he had to make uh, some sort of compromise, he did it, uh, but he didn't emphasize it. And then he would continue to say uh, that he was against tax. He did this on a whole, whole number of things. And so the American people see him as very consistent and principled, when in reality, uh, he was consistent, uh, but he was willing to compromise when he needed to. That, that's what that uh, illustrates to me. What he said. Please, uh, <laughs> Peter. Well, I, I'd like to elaborate a little sure. bit on that 1982 uh, tax increase. Uh, the questioner alluded to it very briefly. Uh, this was part of a bargain that Reagan made with Tip O'Neill. Uh, he would agree to uh, a tax increase of $1 for every $3 that O'Neill and the Democratic House of Representatives would agree to cut in spending. And Reagan thought, given the realities of compromise, that wasn't a bad deal at all. The trouble was uh, his part of the bargain was enacted, and the Democrats never enacted theirs. I see a hand up here. If we could have the uh, Mike join us up there. And I believe we'll have time for this and perhaps one more question after this. Uh, after, after this gentleman here, you'll finish us up with your question. My name is Jack Hunt. Let's phrase this just as a question, John. Good point. You gave the speech to create a society here. But what I'd like Pete to talk about, when he became governor, he created the Program Development Unit, which was dedicated to precisely those issues. Could you talk about that, Pete, about creative society, the bus wall, the town hall? No, Jack, I did not in the uh, in my remarks. I didn't, didn't talk about that. That was a, a single part of his, uh, of his determined effort to make the government more effective Pathetic to uh, the people of the state of California. Uh, Ralph, did you have anything you want to add to that as well? No. Uh, Michael, Jim? Uh, right there, please. Uh, give us one more second. Okay. Uh, first Brilliant of phrasing of questions. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, Velma, I can't answer the question on AIDS because I don't know. Okay. Well, I do. Okay. I'll accept that. I, I, I accept what you say. I, I don't know the, the, the stats on that. Uh, in terms of, of switching services over from the public to the private sector, that was part of Reagan's overall philosophy of the private sector can do it better. The question is, does the private sector actually do it when it's asked to do it? Uh, as governor, and you probably know more about this, and I'd love to hear your comments, Peter, when uh, they transformed the uh, mental health facilities and cut, sh shut a lot of them down, and his promise was the private sector will, and the communities will pick that up. I'd like to hear your comments on that. I'm not sure what happened. Well, I'd be happy to. In the late 50s, the psychiatric profession discovered there were certain uh, medicines and drugs that could be given to uh, people who, were, uh, who could be aided with mental problems and live in society fairly normal lives if they took the medicines on a regular basis. And a great movement started uh, before Reagan became governor, but it's certainly in full force for the head of governor, to close down mental hospitals because <coughs> some of them mistreated patients, not all of them, and not all patients. Uh, and instead to rely on community clinics where mentally ill people would go and pick up their medicine. And he, uh, bent to that uh, popular demand and legislative demand and did 
did that, closed most of the hospitals. The, and this was the trend all over the United States. And as we've all seen, this unleashed a large number of people uh, who became so-called homeless people. Uh, and many of them never picked up their medicines because the community clinics didn't exist in many cases. It didn't happen. But to suggest it was going to be a private sector that was going to build all of these, I don't think so. It was expected that cities and counties would build these clinics, and it didn't happen. Jim, I thought I saw you taking notes, and Ralph, did you have something? I was just going to add something on the, the private sector side. The president's uh, private sector uh, cost control, Peter Grace Commission, put together a report where they recommended savings of $434.4 billion. First time private people were allowed into government agencies to private executives. They had done it in California already because he'd already pulled in a lot of private sector executives, some from our company down in Santa Monica, to, to recommend ways to improve the, the uh, operations of the departments and agencies. So that was number one. Number two on the AIDS uh, issue, that was an issue that came through my council. I wrote several, we met several times with him about the AIDS. We got, uh, the way we handled policy, he was very, he, we had a specific policy process established for him that worked very well. We had about 700 policy meetings in the first term, not with him always there, but he would come when the councils were ready. These were cabinet members, by the way, meeting in these councils, not czars that run things out of the White House. These were cabinet members coming over talking about these issues and so forth. And so on the AIDS issue, we got all the cabinet members together. They all started looking at it from their vantage point. AIDS, you got to know, I had a friend who was uh, a, a, an infectious disease specialist who came to me one year before I went to the White House. said, we found this, uh, this disease that there'll never be a cure for. And I said, you're not supposed to say that. You know, you're a researcher. And he said, oh, this is different. Well, it turned out it was the HIV or AIDS, et cetera. They had discovered it in 81 over in NIH. They finally brought it to us at the White House in 85 and sort of said, okay, here it is. This is going to sweep the country. If we don't do something about it, what should we do? We got all the agencies <laughs> together, as we always do. We put together a plan, et cetera. We finally decided we need to get communicate to the people. And who was the most respected person to communicate it? C. Edward Coop at the time, who was the, the Surgeon General. So Coop sent a letter. We talked about this to every household in the country. That rarely done, because if you think about the mail service and <laughs> places it has to get to. But, and we, we also got OMB together. We moved a lot of money from different agencies into fighting the AIDS. Set up an AIDS commission, and every agency was supposed to figure out what they could do to contribute to fighting this, this disease and so forth. So we tried to help NIH out that had discovered it, and they were going to have to be at the forefront of it, but all the other agencies had it too, because the Defense Department said we're finding it in a lot of our recruits. See, that was one of the issues of the invasive uh, ability to find out that a person was carrying the virus or whatever. And so that was a, not a touchy subject, I mean, not an easy subject to deal with. But he tried to deal with it. Of course, when one of his friends uh, died in Hollywood and so forth, uh, he uh, felt especially strong about it. Jim, you started us off. I saw you had taking notes. Do you have any note you want to finish us up on today? No, I can't think of anything. I think a lot has been said. Well, I appreciate that. I'd like to finish, uh, take a sentence just to recall what our founding dean of the school, Bob Biller, used to ask. He used to ask, uh, what surprised you? And uh, I'm really, as I sit here today, surprised at the extent. We have questions coming from someone who's looking at their Blackberry with the notes that they've taken. Imagine that, and we have us taking notes on, on paper. We have the intergenerational connectedness that Dr. Newland talks about. We have the professional connectedness across levels of government and levels of the public sector, <laughs> nonprofit, and private sector. Uh, and we have uh, scholars and practitioners who have worked and looked at this uh, quite deeply join us here today. So. I'm enormously grateful for it, it. To have a leadership conference, you need great leadership. And we're fortunate to have that leadership in the dean of our school, in Richard, in Stewart, in putting this together, and in these gentlemen joining us here today. So let us thank them again and uh, welcome.